Okay, so uh, we are starting the second session of this morning. Uh, it's the presentation of the transition movement. Maybe you already heard about it, maybe not. Well, then you will find out about it right now. Um, to present the session, we have uh, Camille behind the hand, which is the um, president of the association Ecoattitude. Uh, it's an association which supports local governance and collective change in Geneva region. And we also have Nicolas Briet, which is working in an eco center in France where they organize a lot of activities around sustainability. So let's get started. Thank you, Julie. So, hello, everybody. My name is Camille. I founded and chaired a small NGO in, in Geneva called Eco Attitude, and we promote transition initiative in the Geneva area. We teach sociocracy and work on local currencies. Hello, everybody. Uh, nice to be here with you. I'm Nicolas uh, Brier. I uh, used to be a chemistry student. Uh, I mean, I don't know if there's any chemistry student here, but I, I retired from research to dedicate on uh, finding uh, alternatives now uh, to chemistry. And uh, I'm running a center near Geneva where we do a lot of workshops and exercise the same as you, do, you did this morning. And, uh, okay. and I, I've been interested in transition movements since at least two years. I find it very interesting. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So, we are going to explore the world of transition. What is transition? You may have heard about it. To make it short, Transition Town is a bottom-up movement launched in 2004 by Rob Hopkins, a young visionary, Nico um, Tufeli, the diapo, uh, a, a young teacher. He saw the double problem of peak oil and climate change, and he understood that nothing was really being done or said about it. So he understood that if we wait for governments to do something, it will be too late. If we wait for individuals to act, it will be too little. So the only thing we could really uh, do is have communities become active and then we will possibly find the right solution locally just in time. So when back from his university years in Ireland, he started to stir up his own community and eight years later, transition town Totnes has become a worldwide movement. It has changed its name into transition initiatives and thousands of people have gathered around the idea of organizing resilience together. Now, during this session, we plan to tell you more about the special characteristics that make transition a special movement. We will explain the concept of resilience as well as the transition model and, some ref and give you some reference to continue the work when you're back home. And after that, we will have, as Julie told you, a special session with Rob Hopkins himself, who will answer your questions from Totnes because he doesn't fly anymore. So if you have questions, please write them down to remember them at half past 11 when we will have Rob talk with us directly. But before that, we want you to go through two practical exercises. Not only that these exercises are going to give you an, un an intellectual understanding of what peak oil and climate change is really about, but it's also going to give you an opportunity to raise your voice, to practice speaking to people maybe you don't really know very well, and even stand up in front of an audience 
to make things clear for a large number of people. We'll see if we have time for that. Hands-on as soon as possible. This is very typical from the transition way of doing. Now, you have at every seat a card, which uh, is part of a game on peak oil. This game goes in duos. Um, you have a picture with, on one side, images, and on the other side, an explanation. So you have, every one of you, one minute to read the text, and two minutes to explain it to one of your neighbors while showing the image. When the bell rings, you change roles. The speaker becomes the listener. So it's a way of yourself learning what speak oil is and explain it to somebody else. Here we go for five minutes. Now you start explaining what you just read to one of your neighbors for two minutes maximum. Now you change roles and the listener becomes the speaker for two minutes.
fait une minute, hein, non Dans deux minutes. So, first game is over. Now we go to the second game. How do you feel? Did you learn many things or did you know already everything? Well, we'll see afterwards. So the second game goes in subgroups of six. We don't want you to change your place, but just three chairs turn back to the three behind you, and this makes a group of six. Okay, can you do that now? And we will distribute a new game. C'est le jeu, voilà. Quoi? Ah non, c'est le jeu. Pour ramasser les picoles. Hein? Oui, j'espère qu'il ne mélange pas, mais bon, nous verrons bien. So, now you receive a new uh, set of cards, and this time it's about climate change and global warming. Um, the game is you have one minute to read your text, and then one, maximum two minutes, to explain to the other five what you read. And you can understand that the next exercise will be standing up and explain it to the whole audience, but I don't know whether we will have the time for that. So please enjoy this exercise and having five people listening intensely to what you have to explain. Here we go for 15 minutes. Bell rings every two minutes. So the first minute is to read. You have no card? Ici, il y a, ici, ils n'ont pas de jeu. Et Nico, speed up, ils sont ici, ils ont besoin. Everybody has and something to read. Okay. Hello. You can't.
So now you can start explaining to the group what you've just been reading. Ouais, ouais, je me fous, je me fie à ça. 11 30. Je peux faire des photos et c'est le même appareil. <rire> Mais ils ont fait. So change speaker. Change speaker.
change speaker. Change speaker. Change speaker for the last turn. Okay, game is over. <laughs> 
So you can come back to, to your original place, now that you know everything. Okay, everyone is back. <laughs> Did you like it? <laughs> yes. Okay. So now you, you, you are probably all aware that we are in an emergency state on planet Earth. Um, and, uh, but, but transition movement is not here just to scare you. you know? In fact, uh, it's quite the other way around. The aim of transition movement is to transform this um, uh, fear into something uh, creative and constructive. To, to develop a positive um, mind. Yeah. So, uh, in fact, Rob Hopkins uh, always says that uh, we are, oh, of course, we are in a catastrophic situation, but it's also an opportunity to develop human potential right now. We've never had such an opportunity on Earth, I think. So, we, we should be happy. <laughs> um, and, uh, but something that is very important uh, to know and uh, Transition Movement and Rob Hopkins, uh, he, he used to be a, tr um, a permaculture teacher, so he's, he's got a systemic uh, frame of mind, which means that uh, he, he, you should tackle all the problems uh, in parallel. So the first problem that we've been discussing is uh, peak oil, uh, which means that we, we, don't, uh, we will run out of oil soon, and we need a lot of oil on Earth. So, uh, if you consider only this point, you might say, okay, so we'll try, we'll find something else to burn. We'll, tr we'll find anything to burn to replace oil. Okay, that could be a strategy for this problem. But if we move to the second problem, which is uh, called climate change, uh, here we have a different situation, and here we need to reduce carbon dioxide emission to stabilize the climate. So, we cannot burn everything because it will interfere with climate. And this, this is why we need to think of all problems simultaneously, because if you do that, you will get to a different picture. If you join the two of them, you, you realize that you need to, to rethink completely the system. Uh, you need to design uh, um, a system that is consuming less, far less energy. And you need to develop, for instance, uh, some clean and resilient energy sources. And uh, in fact, and if you can go back, because in fact, this is, we present only two problems, but if you think on top of that, we have a, a financial crisis uh, looming, <laughs> which makes the situation even more difficult because you need to, we need to consider this aspect also. So we need to tackle all of it all together. <laughs> so what can be done? Um, so we have different levels. We have essentially four one. We have the global level, we have the national level, we have the community level, and we have the personal level. So on global level, we, we can try to bring together all the countries like we did for um, Copenhagen or Rio plus 20 recently. And we realize that it's not so easy to find, uh, to take decision all together because uh, each country has its own agenda, its own economic problems, and because of the, the critical uh, financial crisis, no one is quite happy to reduce its carbon emission because that means reducing economic activity also uh, right now. So we are stuck. No one wants to make the first move. Uh, so it's difficult. Um, on a national level, each country is trying to find its own uh, solution. Like in, uh, in the UK, they have uh, tradable energy quotas. In France, they make uh, carbon taxes. I'm sure all your countries maybe is trying something different. Uh, from what I know, um, all these strategies have been quite uh, insatisfying, insufficient, uh, even sometimes inefficient. Um, so, okay, so we can, that can be improved. On the local community level, 
um, this is where the transition movement is the most uh, active. Uh, we realize that we need to relocalize the economy. Uh, this is clear. We need people to get together, to share information, experiences, ideas, uh, and we need to develop cooperation at local level. Uh, well, we need to develop cooperation at every level, you might say, but uh, because we are on the local level, we can start there. And for instance, the transition movement has developed uh, a website that is uh, shared by all the transition movement in the world, which are more than 300 sharing the same website. And thanks to that, you can share a lot of uh, experiences. Uh, you can see what works, what doesn't work. And this is uh, very helpful for everyone. And now let's move to the personal level. Uh, this is important too, because if we want to make change uh, worldwide, we need to also make change inside, because uh, most of the problems, in fact, are accumulated effect of what we all do every day. Uh, like we have some, some be beliefs in our mind, uh, such as, for instance, uh, we will always have uh, enough energy, or uh, growth is important and growth is happiness. Uh, like uh, humans are the top of the food chain and we are dominating all those species and all that. And another belief, important one, is to say that technology will find solutions and technology will solve all our problems. So this, is, this could be challenged because all of these assumptions might not be true and we need to really uh, look inside. And the second thing about personal is that all these changes, all these things, the crisis coming, it can create a lot of fears in people. Just thinking about it can be fearful. And this is something to, to work on, you know, to transform this fear into hope that we can do something about it. So, if we know many of the solutions already available, what's stopping us? Why don't we move? We know that we have to, and we don't do anything. So first of all, there are a bunch of dominant stories of cultural myths of our time, reinforced whenever we switch on TV, when we look at billboard or watch pictures. Each of us carries some of these myths without, with us, day in, day out, like more is better, like, there's not enough for everybody, there's no alternative, we have no choice, humans are selfish and greedy by nature, don't try anything with them. We all more or less think these things, and we have to challenge that. Transition is doing quite a lot of work in this field, working with the psychology of change, questioning the fundamental values, that underpin our behaviors and try and localize the roots of our fears. Fear of change, fear of lacking, fear of your neighbor, fear of everything. And see how we transfer these fears to our children through education. So, during the last five decades, you remember the ones of you who saw the peak oil card about the bell-shaped curve of Hubbard, huh? that leads, this bell-shaped curve that leads us to the peak all uphill. So during the last five decades going up the mountain of the oil curve, humans have been able to develop extraordinary inventiveness to exploit the infinite usages of oil in everyday life, in every domain of our daily life. So why wouldn't they, why wouldn't we, continue to make use of our intelligence, imagination and creativity downhill to create a better life and a more sustainable world without oil? We can do it. We have to want it. Transition urges us to use our imagination and creativity and above all, harness our power of a positive vision of the future. How 
can we start to build our future if we are not even able to imagine it? Transition definitely is a positive-minded, creative movement based on the idea that it's more fun to be part of it than not to, and that better prepare our future than undergo it. So you never change, yeah. You never change things by. <laughs> you never change things by fighting the existing reality to change something, build a new model that makes the existing one obsolete. <laughs> Good summary. And so transition is um, it's a social experiment on a massive scale in real time. And because of that, because it's never been done before, we have no certainty, and I'm sorry about that, but we have no certainty it's going to work. <laughs> but it's worth trying. Um, but what, I mean, it's not sure to work, it will depend on each of us, in fact. We need to, each of us need to re-empower, um, to feel re-empowered, and we need our communities, uh, we need to re-empower our neighbors too, our family, everyone. Any, any, uh, we need the help of everyone. Everyone needs to be committed and everyone needs to get involved because it's not going to come from the top or from, uh, from outer space or it, we, we have to do it ourselves. And we need to all get involved personally and the three parts of our bodies need to be involved, which is uh, first the head. This is what we've done in the previous exercise. We need to understand um, with our mind what's going on in the world. Uh, okay, and I'm, I'm sure you're quite good at that. The second part is the heart, which means that we need to listen to our emotions, our pain, our need for joy, our beliefs. And in fact, um, the fear, I mean, if you care about the planet, about other species, uh, it can be very distressing to think about all that is coming. It can create a lot of fear inside you. But this can be transformed. And in fact, um, Transition Movement have, has worked with uh, the work from Joanna Macy, uh, the work that reconnects, and we have books here. You can come and see. Uh, Joanna Macy has explained how you can transform like fear into some, some positive energy or even anger. Anger is a very powerful source of energy if you manage to canalize it. And this is, transition is using that too. And the third part is the hands, of course, because we are not going to discuss and do meetings all day. At some point, we need to get things done, to get some projects moving. We need to, to show people that it's, something is happening. We are building the new system. And the whole point of that is to develop what is called resilience. I don't know if you've heard of resilience. Um, it's a um, scientific term that was used in mechanics, I think. Uh, originally, it meant uh, the capacity of a system to absorb disturbance and reorganize while undergoing change, so as, so as to still retain essentially the same function, structure, identity, and feedback. And my understanding of resilience as a system, as a group of people, um, resilience uh, describes our ability to absorb shock and our ability to readapt and reorganize to still function on planet Earth, always. <laughs> so, um, transition is a community-led process. Um, so you have essentially two movements. You have some bottom-up movements and some top-down top movements. Um, and essentially, uh, uh, previously we had like, as individuals, we tried to do, I'm sure you all do, you all try to do the best you can to, to lower your carbon impact. I'm sure you have bicycle, I'm sure you are switching off the lights when you go out of a room. Uh, I'm sure you're doing everything you can where you are, and this is good, and I congratulate you. And on the other side, you have governments and politicians who are trying to find global solutions and they do everything they can. I'm sure it can be done better, but, uh, and in, in, the, in, the bit, in between there is a gap. There is a gap between politicians and us. 
and transition movement is trying to fill this gap by connecting individuals as you are to bring individuals together because uh, it's not, it will never be enough to do individual action. We, need to do, we can do much more when we come together. Like if you think about car sharing, if you think about uh, producing electricity, if 100 people come together. Uh, and, and it's important, transition movement encourage you to, to form a group, to organize with your neighbor or with your own community, to create a community. And when you, you get started, after you can go and meet the politicians and you can tell them what you're doing, and, you, and, and it's very important that you get in touch with them at some point, because we need both um, world to connect through the community. But beware, local authorities should support you, but the community is driving, not the local authorities. So, Let's see the 12 steps of the transition model. It's only a, suge a suggestion. Um, transition doesn't impose any program. This is the way the Totnes people worked, and they described their process so as to make it available for the others, but you will do as well as you can in your community, maybe changing the order of these steps. But these steps have proven to be working. So the first thing to do is to set up a steering group. Um, to put a core team in place to drive the project forward during the initial phases. In starting this initiative off, you will need to gather some like-minded souls to you in order to drive forward the first stage of the process. But from its first meeting, that group must design its own transformation in setting a defined lifespan. This is to prevent seizure of the transition initiative by a subgroup of motivated activists. Transition must be taken over by the community. So the new pilot, after the first initiating group has been disbanded, will be formed by the delegates of each working group you've been able to set up. But more of this is being described in the books, um, the Transition Handbook, in English and in French, you can have all the details. Uh, we just want to go through the 12 steps so you more or less know what it's about. Second step is awareness raising. Um, this is an important step to prepare and to prepare your community for change. Uh, this is why we've done this exercise with you. It's important to understand the issues like of global warming and peak oil so that you have a desire to do something about it because you understand. So it's important. But uh, so like in Geneva, uh, Eco Attitude organized some film projections, some talks uh, where we have food all together and then we discuss. And so the first point is that we understand better. We can ask questions. We can un develop our understanding. But also we can meet other people and they start developing this kind of network. You can also network with other existing group in, in your town. And the third advantage of this is that you're not, uh, instead of watching the film on your own, the very scary documentaries on your own, it's better to watch the group so you can talk about it. You can transform your loneliness and your fears and, and think, okay, we can do something. The third step is to lay the foundations. This stage is about networking with existing group and activists, making clear to them that the transition initiative is designed to incorporate their previous efforts and future inputs by looking at the future in a new way. The idea is to acknowledge and honor the work they've already been doing and stress that they have a vital role to play that we are not pushing them aside to be the new heroes. 
um, then the following step is to organize what they call a great unleashing, which you can call a big party. In fact, this is a milestone in, the, in your transition initiative. This happens maybe one and one and a half year after you started the steering group. This should be a big event, so you should really prepare it properly. It should be some memorable event that everyone will remember for many years. And the energy you will develop during this party will take you to the next stage. It will build some momentum for your group to move forward. In fact, it's, it should be a magnetic event where everyone thinks, oh, I want to join this group, it looks fun, you know? Next step is form working subgroups, thematic subgroups. Part of the process of developing an energy descent action plan. Pardon? So we've changed yesterday. So before, before what Camille is describing, there, are, there is a step. The step before is to use some tools that comes from, uh, from the US. It's called Open Space Technology and World Cafe. You might have heard of them. In fact, these two techniques are for big groups. They are kind of uh, collective intelligence tools to bring out a lot of ideas, a lot of new projects, and a lot of energy. Um, they've been used a lot everywhere in the world, not only by transition movement. And this is essential to, for the step that Kami will describe right now. <laughs> so back to the subgroups, thematic subgroups. Part of the process of developing an energy descent action plan, EDEP, is tapping into the collective genius of the community. One of the most effective ways to do this is to set up a number of smaller groups to focus on specific aspects of the process. Each of these groups will develop very autonomously their own ways of working and their own activities, but will all fun fall under the umbrella of the project as a whole. So the idea is really to empower people to take their responsibility and do the job without waiting that some boss or chief gives the indication. And you can also bring in existing groups. It may not always be necessary to actually start a new group from scratch. Sometimes there may be existing groups in the area who have done lots of work in a particular subject. So I want just to give you the example of what we are doing in Geneva, where there are so many active groups, both sides of the border, most of the time not even knowing each other. So we chose to set up a virtual collaborative working place where they all can gain some visibility and above all be able to locate each other as to, so as to start collaboration. This virtual space is an open source device and I recommend it to you. It's called Open Atrium. It provides various collaborative functions like task distribution, document sharing, shared calendar, forums, chats, twitters, and it's free. In the future, we intend to develop this portal into a virtual marketplace with a regional community currency. Uh, we have been building this portal with the help of Community Forge, which is a non-profit association that designs, develops and distributes worldwide free open source software for building communities with currencies. So remember that address if you consider building a collaborative transition portal or you may even go to their workshop this afternoon because they're here. Um, step seven is develop visible practical manifestations of your project. It's essential 
that you avoid any sense of your project is just a talking shop where you sit around and draw up with lists. Your project needs from an early stage to begin to create practical, high visibility manifestations in your community. These will significantly enhance people's perceptions of the project and also their willingness to participate. These things can take various forms. It can be the launching of a community currency, it can involve solar panels or hemp and lime plastering or community gardening. Or, for instance, I don't know if you heard, you've heard of the fantastic experience of the incredible edible people in Todd Morden, which is a small village somewhere in England, and they um, started to grow around town for anyone to pick or harvest for free. And it's a fantastic project which glued the community together, and it has a worldwide um, notoriety. So have a look at incredible Edible Todd Morden. It's a really fascinating experience. Uh, next step is to facilitate the great reskilling, uh, which is, uh, to me, learning to do things by ourselves. Because if you, if you imagine an uh, oil crisis, a uh, big one, and imagine that uh, supermarkets are suddenly empty or closed, uh, you will have to learn to do things by yourself, like do your own clothes, do your own food, do your own energy, uh, do you everything. <laughs> so it's very interesting to, to think about it right now and to prepare for that. And it's, it's also a very empowering exercise because it's, it's a lot of uh, fun and satisfaction to learn everything we can do by ourselves. Uh, we can solve problems, we can achieve practical results, we can work together, and you can be on both sides. You can teach others what you can do, and you can learn from others, so that's, it, it goes both ways, usually. So, as examples, uh, you can learn how to repair a bike, you can learn how to cook, you can learn how to grow food, you can learn how to build a house uh, with uh, straw bales, <laughs> you can learn how to recognize medicinal plants. There are thousands of things you can learn and share. Um, and essentially, this is a very uh, high networking tool and fundraising uh, exercise. Build bridges to local government. Well, I'll give them the mic, uh, Nico, because we have already talked about that. Mm -hmm. um, so the next step is, is to honor, honor the elders of your community. Um, that's essential because, first of all, they are quite, I mean, I don't, in France, uh, we tend to forget our elders, and I think that's uh, not uh, very positive things. And also, we should remember that the elders can be a great source of information and knowledge because some of the eldest have been living before the oil age, so they lived before we used oil to do everything. And just ask them, go and visit them, uh, they will be quite pleased to welcome you and ask them questions. How did you live before oil? You know, uh, how did you produce energy? How did you organize? How did you co collaborate with others? And you can learn a lot from them. And this is, this is important. And the second thing is that uh, we are not saying that we are going to go back to the 1920s. You know, we'll never go back to prehistory because some people are afraid of that with ecologists. Uh, but what it means that we will learn from what they did before, we will learn from what we can do now, and we will find like a co combination, a very creative one, to see how can we get out of this problem. Next step is let it go where it wants to go. Transition initiatives are nightmares for control freaks. You, your role is not to come up with all the answers, but to act as a catalyst for the community to design their own transition. Remember, transition is not a political party with a planified program. Transition is about stirring up the community. 
If you keep your focus on the key design criteria, which is building community resilience and reducing carbon footprint, you'll watch as the collective genius of the community enables a feasible, practical and highly inventive solution to emerge. Okay, produce and start to implement the energy decent action plan. This means uh, to reduce your energy consumption. Uh, at this stage of the process, you will have different working groups, some on energy, some on transport, some on food production, and each group will try to find its own solution on, well, on what it works on, to find how can, you, can I reduce my energy consumption, like in food production or in transport. And so each, and this is essential because as we said earlier, uh, if we want to tackle peak oil and climate change, we need to reduce drastically the energy consumption. Voilà, merci. So as you see, transition is most of all uh, a state of mind and a toolbox. Uh, some of the tools uh, we have already been mentioning, like visioning, we have to vision a positive future. This is what we are going to do this afternoon in the workshop. Timeline and backcasting is this very typical method that Transition used, which is to start with a vision of the desired future and to work backwards to find out how we can get there, which brings up a set of very different solutions and ideas than if you start from where we are now. Um, <clears throat> local currencies is an excellent way to relocalize economy while keeping the community's wealth within its territory. Community currencies are not meant to replace the main currency, but to complement it. A healthy economy should walk on two legs, the soft currency locally and the hard currency internationally. There are wonderful books being written about that. Bernard Liettard, uh, I think he's written it in French, but his, his book has been translated. Try and read it, it's fascinating. And just before we move, because uh, open space is a tool. Yeah. We'll, we'll give you a taste of open space this afternoon in the workshop for those who want to try. Um, next one is about transition priorities. Um, I mentioned it earlier. Uh, it means that individual gestures uh, are important, very important, but are not enough. And we need to come back as communities to, to get, to develop, uh, to deploy more power. Um, and to start acting, and uh, as I said also earlier, uh, usually there are different groups on agriculture, energy, community, and inner transition. People in agriculture tend to learn how to grow food locally, uh, to grow food by themselves and use permaculture usually. Energy groups tr tend to develop car sharing, develop energy production. Community groups usually develop community currencies. Also learn to work in groups. This is an essential part, how to have an effective meeting, uh, use uh, governance tools like sociocracy. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's very efficient. And some groups work on, work on inner transition and essentially use uh, the Joanna Macy books uh, to transform fear into positive actions. These are the community currencies from England, you can see. So, I will be quick because Rob Hopkins is waiting for us. There are more than a thousand transition initiatives around the planet now, almost as many mulling to be labeled. Now we hope that you are going to be the next seeds of the coming generation of transition sprouts and that this map is going soon to show 70 new mulling spots. Before ending, as a representative of the generation of your grandparents and as an experienced activist for so many years and a lover of the miracle of life, 
I would like to add one last personal touch to this presentation. Time is getting short. We need to speed up the invention of a new society before the planet is made utterly unlivable. So we need people with courage, with tenacity, with clairvoyance and leadership. When you go back home, do get trained. Learn to be a good leader. It's a skill, not a privilege. And we need good leaders. Learn transition methods. Learn sociocratic governance. Foster, above all, women leadership. And don't let yourself be trapped with the idea that leadership is bad. On the contrary, we need good leaders who know the difference between power over and power with. So these are a bunch of links for you to continue the work. Go and see what they contain. And we, we can come back to it after we finish. And just to, do, to finish uh, this talk, we'd like to end up with a, a quote that we like very much from Margaret Mead. That we, is a good summary of the talk. Uh, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>Okay, so now if uh, we are doing the connection with Rob Hopkins, and if you have a question, I will bring you the microphone, so just raise your hand. One second, we are adjusting the image. Uh, can you see the, the room? I can. Hi. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Welcome to Rob Hopkins. Thank you for being with us. Oh, image. Ah, okay. So, is there any question anyone will ask? Just raise your hand. Yeah, all right. Do you hear us? Uh, I can hear perfectly. I don't know if you can hear outside my window, there is someone busking with an accordion. Okay. So you may hear music coming in through so the window. Just please so. give your name and the country. Hi, I'm Kasia from Germany. Hi, Rob. Thank you for being with us. Um, I actually just want to ask your energy decent action plan. You presented it to your local authorities, right? And what impact did it have? Uh, it depends which one do you mean. Do you mean the one in Ireland or the one here in England? Um, um, excuse me? Well, there, uh, there are two. So the, the first, the very first energy descent action plan was done for Kinsale in Ireland, which is where transition started. And that was given to the council, and the council uh, were very supportive of it. But I left Kinsale then, um, and I know that Transition Kinsale have been doing some uh, elements of it, but uh, it was done as a student project. It wasn't created by the community. Here in, in Totnes, in England, which is the first transition initiative in the UK, we did an energy descent plan about two years ago. That's and our fun. town council have adopted that plan and call themselves now, think of themselves as a transition town council. And the next stage on from that, we're, we're now nearly finishing a big piece 
of work that we've done with them and with the district council and the chamber of commerce and the local colleges and local businesses which is we call an economic blueprint which is a more detailed mapping of the local economy and how and starts to put some numbers to the arguments about localization because previously people would say we need to make our economy lo more local and more resilient but then we couldn't argue the economic case for that but this uh, economic blueprint which builds off the energy descent plan does that and it's very exciting because it's the town council's economic blueprint mm -hmm. and it sets out the financial benefits of of localizing there are about five or six different places now that have done energy descent plans. It's quite a big thing to do. Uh, but other places have done them much, much smaller than the Totnes one and just as good, I think. So it's, it's an idea which is still uh, emerging, I think. Right. And could you give some examples of um, actions that are raised in a typical energy descent plan? Energy, decent yeah, I think the, <laughs> the idea is that if we talk about uh, a world, a lower carbon world and a fossil fuel free world and a more localized world, that's, very, that's a very hard thing to imagine. And even if we could imagine it, how on earth do we get there from here? It feels unimaginable. So what an energy descent action plan does is it tells the story of what it could be like in terms of food and energy and building and education. You know, what would it what would it be like? What would you, your town be like if you had actually done this successfully? What would the food economy be like? What work would there be? How would the uh, where where would the energy come from? And then when you can sort of tell that story, particularly if you generate that story with lots and lots of people around you, then you start to work backwards. You say by 2030 we want it like this. So by 2015, we need to have done this so that by 2020, we can do this. You know, you start to set out a kind of a, a pathway about how you're going to get there. Uh, and already here in Totnes, quite a few of the things that, are, that were in our energy descent plan are, are now actually starting to happen, whether it's the community energy company uh, putting, uh, uh, putting up windmills near the town, whether it's a food hub, whether it's uh, new developments, whether it's local currency, these things, that once that story is there and people can imagine that story, then the energy starts to, to divert towards making that happen. And one last question. How big is transi the transition movement in Totnes? Like how many people are really involved in this transition movement? I see it's great ideas, I see it's great projects. But when you talk about civil society engagement, just I'd be wondering how many people are actually really involved in the, in the movement. Yeah, that's a good question. I think I think so, sometimes people imagine that in order to do anything like this, you have to have absolutely everybody in your community on board. And there's a very good book that um, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a few years ago called The Tipping Point, which some of you may have read. And he says in there that you need somewhere between 15 and 17 percent of a population in order to tip an idea and for it to gain a lot of traction. Uh, I did a survey in Totnes in 2010, which we need to redo and see how it's changed. But in 2010, 75% uh, of people had heard of Transition Town Totnes. 62% of people thought it was a good idea and that they, they agreed with what it was trying to do. Uh, a third of people had had some kind of engagement with it, had been to an event, had been involved in some way. And probably about four or five percent were very actively involved, you know, were involved in a project, involved in a working group. Um, I think what m my observation is, is that, um, is that the power of something like transition comes in changing the story that the place tells about itself. Yeah, so uh, uh, what you see in Totnes now is that actually when people write letters to the paper, they say things like, well, seeing as how we're a transition town, surely we should da 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 And lots of local traders see people coming to visit the town because of that. The local council feel very proud of the fact that we're a transition initiative. You know, it's, it's something that... Uh, 
it starts to change the story that the place tells about itself. And this blueprint thing I mentioned that we're doing with the town council is a good example of that. But, you know, if you came to Totnes and you just stopped randomly people in the street and asked, are you involved with Transition Town Totnes? You know, the majority of people wouldn't be involved in it, but they would know about it and they would, they would largely be supportive of it and think it was a good idea. And, you know, they may have been involved in some aspect of what it's doing. Okay, thank you. We have a next question here. Hi there. My name is Kayla from Canada, and I'd like to thank you so much for being here. Um, my question is, can you give some advice on how to respond when people say it's too idealistic and it's, and it's unachievable? Um, you know, I'm always really surprised at how few people say that to me, actually. Um, I think uh, I think if you read if you followed the news this week about what's happening with the melting of the ice in the Arctic, and if you follow the response, the government's responses around the world, which still seems to be we have to make the economy grow again at all costs, we have to get economic growth going again, and we need new big infrastructure projects, and we need to be fracking gas, and we need to. Uh, you know, we need new airports. And at the same time as the, the scientists are saying, this is, this is a disaster. If you talk to people who are climate scientists who study what's happening in the Arctic over the last month or so, they, they're pale. You know, the, uh, what they're seeing there in terms of the melting of the ice there, the, the, IP, the last IPCC report said that we would start to see some significant breakup, in their worst case scenario, some significant breakup of Arctic ice by 2100. Uh, now, when all the, the this, this summer has just fallen off the bottom of most of the graphs, and the scientists are saying this could all be gone by 2015. Now, this is really, 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 really serious. And the weather in America this year, extreme weather all over the world, you know, it's. Uh, and actually, so for me, I, th I think actually the challenge is. Uh, and, and also then we have the whole economic situation with crisis, which is only just beginning in, in, in Europe and in other parts of the world, as the debt that we've basically piled up during the last 50 years of our fossil fuel party binge uh, is really sort of uh, coming home to roost. It feels to me like actually the, the people who argue that we can make the economy grow again and that somehow the climate will heal itself and that somehow all this debt will just disappear, and that somehow we'll find more uh, cheap energy in order to, 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 to fuel economic growth again, other people who are living in a fantasy land, actually. And uh, for me, actually, the movement of people around the world who are looking and saying what we need to do is, uh, is, is design a post-growth economy, which is founded on well-being, on happiness, on social justice, on inclusion, on equality, uh, one which shifts its focus from economic globalization, where it's cheaper for me in Devon to buy an apple from New Zealand than to buy an apple from up the road, and where the UK exports as much, uh, um, uh, uh, as many, one and a half million kilos of UK potatoes go to Germany every year, and we import one and a half million kilos of potatoes to the UK from Germany. This economic model is insane. And so to argue that actually the future of our, eco of our economy, the future of the economy that, that, that you guys will be uh, sort of making happen and setting up enterprises in and building livelihoods in, is going to be inherently more local, is going to be focused on, on, on resilience. Uh, it, the degree to which it depends on fossil fuels will be the degree to which it is vulnerable. Uh, I think that lots and lots of people now can actually see that that's an enormous opportunity and that it's not about moving away from things. It's not about going back to live in a cave. It's about creating a future which is actually uh, appropriate to the world we're moving into and is actually thrilling in its opportunity and its potential. So if anybody ever says that to me, uh, I have a good answer for them, I think. <laughs> okay. Did you have your answer? Okay, next question. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. Hey, I'm Helen from Lund University in Sweden. 
And um, yes, I was actually wondering, I mean, you've been um, scratching on the topic already with your last answer, but um, I've been surprised that transition was kind of born out of the peak oil problem. Because for me, peak oil is, well, maybe merely a technological problem, which we have several fixes for. I mean, it's just if you want to get more oil, just turn coal into oil. Or sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to hear the question, actually. Um, I'm sorry. Could you, could you, could you speak, maybe speak a bit louder? Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, is that better? Or I don't want to okay. scream. Or... <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, it, like peak oil is kind of, or let's say, peak oil in combination with climate change is the basis or, or which created the transition movement, if you say so. Um, and uh, yeah, for me, peak oil is really not a problem because you can turn coal into oil. I mean, that's just a technological thing, kind of, that we can easily solve with existing technology. And um, I always hear like when people hear in the news that you know maybe Russia has found a new oil field in the Arctic or I don't know, then everyone is relieved and says, good luck, so we can continue to live our lifestyle and we're not running out of oil that fast. And like my perspective of the whole issue is that we can easily live on oil for the next hundreds of years, probably, um, but, you know, or any substitute of oil. But the point being is that we have a limited atmosphere. And if we ever reach that point where there's no oil left, then probably the atmosphere cannot sustain human life or any other mammal's life for that matter. So yeah, I was surprised what was your, like how come peak oil kind of made you bring up transition? Um. Well, there are two parts to that question, I think. The first part is, is the part about climate. And I would really recommend uh, an article that Bill McKibben wrote in Rolling Stone magazine in the most recent edition, the one with Justin Bieber on the cover, um, um, where he said, that, he said that in terms of climate change, there are three numbers that, that we need to remember. The first one is two degrees, that we have to keep the climate below two degrees, and even that is, is, is very, very optimistic. You know, that we've already gone up 0.8 degrees on pre-industrial levels, and we're seeing the sort of, we're seeing things that people really didn't think. The climate is much, much more sensitive than we imagined. And even if we stop burning all fossil fuels today, there is still another 0.6 degrees that is sort of in the that we've already emitted that hasn't started to have its impact yet. So it doesn't give us very much room to maneuver. And then he has a figure which I can't remember, which is which is the the figure for the amount of um, uh, fossil fuels that we can afford to burn and stay below two degrees. And then he has the figure of the amount of fossil fuels that remain in the world, and it's five times as much. So we can only afford to burn a fifth of the fossil fuel reserves that we have. And as you say, there are, there are reserves of coal, there are reserves of gas, there are reserves of oil. There are different perspectives, though, in, in, terms, of, in terms of what remains. You know, there, there is peak oil does not mean that we run out of oil in the morning. It does not, it does not refer to... to uh, dropping off a cliff. If you look at all the graphs about peak oil, they go up and then they go down. And the downside probably has a longer lag than the, the, than the going up. So that second half of the oil age, there's an enormous amount of hydrocarbons in there. And there's enough hydro, hydrocarbons, as you say, to push the temperature of this planet up 10, 15 degrees, which would all, by, all but wipe out life on this planet, really. Um, but at the same time, in the same way that you can talk about a game of football as being a game of two halves, you can think of the oil age as being an age as, as having two very distinct halves. So the oil age up until now, the last 150 years, has been characterized by cheap uh, fossil fuels, fossil fuels that are easy to extract, fossil fuels uh, that are of, of high quality and uh, fossil fuels that you have to put a small amount of energy in to get energy out. In Saudi Arabia in the 1930s, you put one unit of energy in, you got 100 units of energy out. Historically, that's unprecedented for humanity, being able to access that much energy 
since then, you know, we've used about a million years worth of, of fossil of, of, uh, of fossilized uh, ancient sunlight every year. And now what we have ahead of us, the downward side, there's still energy in there, but we have to put a lot more energy in to get to get energy back out again. So conventional oil production now is about 20 to one. The Alberta tar sands are about two to one. Uh, you know, these things are, are, are not the same at all. The environmental impacts of them is absolutely disastrous. Uh, and they only work because oil prices are high. The, the Alberta tar sands work when oil costs about $80 a barrel. And actually, uh, the, 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 there's also a, a big concern about the, the reserves that are stated by governments. There were papers last year and WikiLeaks uh, revealed documents saying that uh, the Saudi Arabian government actually have reserves 40% less than they were saying they are. And yesterday it was reported that, that Saudi Arabia will become a net importer of oil by 2030. That's 18 years away. Uh, you know, and, and in terms of coal, you know, there are people who will tell you there's 100 years worth of coal left. But there's also people who've gone back through all of that and, and, and who've said, actually, the reserves are nothing like that. Um, and as the, as the impacts, you know, what, what the International oil Energy Agency say now is we have to leave oil before oil leaves us. And uh, uh, and uh, you know we see we see energy price volatility still uh, being all over the place. So it's not that we're about to run out of hydrocarbons. There are still hydrocarbons. Uh, if we want oil, as you say, we can extract uh, we can extract oil from from um, uh, coal. That's what Hitler did during during the war. But um, but from a climate perspective, it's catastrophic. And that only works because it's very, very expensive. It's very expensive to do. So really, it's not that the age of it's not that we've run out of oil, but the age of cheap oil is over, and we enter an age of increasing volatility. Where actually, if you want to build an economy, if you uh, locally or nationally, you, that oil vulnerability is a key, key weakness. Okay. Did you have your answer? Yes. Okay. We have uh, another question, right? Hello, my name is Teresa. I'm from Lund University. So it's, yeah. My question is, um, there are a lot of emerging theories now, for example, the integral theory, that we should not, we should, we forget, but we should not, or we should include the inner dimension of change and transition. And we also had it in uh, the lecture before, that there are emerging, that you um, work in the inner dimension, but I was wondering, what, what are your thoughts on that? And how is Sorry, it included? I'm, not, I'm, struggling, I'm struggling to hear that again. Could you maybe Sorry. just speak a little bit slower louder? and louder? Okay. <laughs> no, I'm, um, I'm wondering that there are emerging theories that we need to um, include more the inner dimension of change and transition, but we are not doing that uh, enough. So I'm wondering what is your, how is the transition movement, how do you include the inner dimension of change and transition in your work? So I didn't really. So it was the question: How do we? How, how do how, we? How do you? How do you? How do you work with like the inner dimension of change? Oh, okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks. <laughs> well, I think. Um, I mean, I've been involved in the environmental movement since I was about fifteen, and um, and it really struck me that a lot of the time people. Uh, that, that, that there is a sense that everything is so urgent and it has to happen now that, that, that people uh, uh, almost, you know, they, they, could, they go at it and they go at it and they don't sleep and they don't look after themselves. And, you know, the, the rate of burnout in people involved in environmental activism is very, very high. It's, uh, it, people don't acknowledge the impact that this has on them. You know, if you, if you spend your whole day reading papers about climate change and thinking through the implications of those papers and and they don't have any impact on you you know and you imagine that that's not affecting you on some kind of a level that's really naive i think and 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 as a transition group if you if you call together your community and you show them as some incredibly depressing film about climate change and then you say thank you bye then good night and they all wander off out into their town feeling like someone's let a bomb off inside their head you know uh, is really irresponsible i think so we always try in transition that when you present something like that you you build it in time to discuss it and digest it with other people you present it in the context of what can we do about this and where you know where do we go from here um and also i think 
uh, it's so it's really important to notice that this stuff has an impact, and also that when we talk about resilience, community resilience, it do, it doesn't just mean food systems and renewable energy systems and local currencies and that kind of thing. It's also about personal resilience. We're entering a time of very rapid change. We're already in a time of very rapid change. You know, when you're in it, maybe you don't see how quickly things have changed. But if you look at how the economic situation has changed just in the last two to three years, it's it's extraordinary. And how the climate change situation has accelerated in the last couple of years. You know, we're living in that time now. You know, we've, for years people talked about the time when things would start to change very quickly. This is it. We're there now. You know, things are changing very, very rapidly. And as people in that... You know, we also need to be looking at personal resilience and how do we help each other to be resilient and how do we share the kind of the grief that we feel when we're, when we're moving away from the things that we imagined were going to be lying ahead of us. So, so in transition, there is, a, th th there is an emphasis on the idea that uh, you also, when you're, one of the key elements of success is that when you set up a transition group, that you give that group the skills to be able to work together. You know, over the last 20, 30 years, we've become very isolated from each other and we've forgotten how to work with other people and, and give and take and, and discuss things and, uh, and, and deal with conflict and that kind of thing. So we always say that in, in transition, that first stage of setting up the group and making sure people are, can, can communicate properly and that kind of thing is really, really important because if we imagine as I think in many ways the environmental movement has done for a long time, that the scale of the change that we need to make is just an inner process, uh, sorry, just an outer process, and it's just about windmills and solar panels and growing carrots on the roof, uh, you know, then we miss, uh, we miss a really important part of it, which is about how we, uh, you know, how we cope with it as, as human beings. Hi. Um my name is Daria, I'm from um, Berkeley, California, and um, actually I have a question. I was hoping you could comment a bit about um, how the transition towns um, sees its energy future, because I'm an engineer, so that's what I'm studying, and um, I understand that it's a bottom-up movement, and I was wondering if you see the energy to be you know, off-grid, or um, if it is grid connected and it's a distributed system, then it seems to be more, it requires a, a infrastructure and to be more of a top bottom um, sort of approach. So that's why I'm kind of, I cannot see how those things could work in, in harmony and um, sort of really work in, in real life. So I was hoping you could comment on that. Okay. Um, so, so the, the, um, from a transition perspective, the argument is that we need to decarbonize our energy generation system as rapidly and urgently as possible. And that is an enormous undertaking. That's, that's a bigger challenge in the time frame that we have than uh, you know, getting a man on the moon, really. And particularly as the political will for that seems to be starting to fade and, and, and does, doesn't have political support. I don't know if anybody saw Mitt Romney's um, uh, remarks about climate change the other day, which uh, were just extraordinary. Um, I think the idea is, uh, so what transition isn't about is about decentralizing all, all the energy and breaking the grid up into tiny little pieces, because firstly, that's not really very practical, because at the moment, like where I am here in Totnes, for example, if we wanted to take Totnes off the grid, uh, all of the infrastructure, the current dis infrastructure for distributing distributing that energy is um, is run by is owned by the national grid. So we would have to build a parallel grid, which would be just prohibitively expensive. And also, then there are real social justice questions in there, in that actually that the wealthy wealthy towns might be able to do that, and then there's no way that the poorer towns and neighbourhoods are going to be able to do that. So you're going to end up with, uh, with, with something that's really not very good from that perspective. I think what we need to do is to keep a national grid, but the, as much as possible, when we're putting in place uh, the things that are going to feed energy into that grid, those, that, that renewable energy generation is owned by local communities uh, and the, who then benefit from it. So, for example, here in Totnes, we have a community energy company called the Totnes Renewable Energy Society, has 500 members, local people who've bought shares in that energy company. 
it's just applying for planning permission now to put up two 2.3 megawatt turbines on the edge of town and the, and and those will be owned by this community and the profits the money that it generates will then come into this town in order to uh, support renewable energy projects to support energy conservation initiatives here in the town rather than just being owned by some distant company who are hoovering all of that money away and in germany something like 50% of of renewables going in place are owned by the community and in Denmark, I think it's even higher. In the UK, it's something like 3%. So there's massive scope for, for, for community renewables. Um, and they're a fantastic way for a community to start to take its own future into its hands, really, in that sense. But at the same time, we need such a massive amount of infrastructure that even if all the communities uh, put all their money together, it would still only be enough to fund about 25% we calculate of what we need. So we still need also to bring in big invest, big money and big investment in order to, to put that, that, that grid into place. Um, one of the best things I've seen on this is the Centre for Alternative Technology in, uh, in Wales produced a study called Zero Carbon Britain 2030, which was their setting out of, of, of how they thought that that could happen uh, with lots of offshore wind, uh, community renewables uh, uh, and a sort of a shift to electricity as the main uh, power source for lots of things um, and you can get that online you can download that for free so I, I would really recommend that but I think the key element of it is uh, that energy needs to move from being something well like everything really where actually whether it's a food system which is now you know controlled by a handful of, of enormous corporations whether it's uh, um, uh, uh, you know all, all the different elements. You know, sort of in, in terms of retail. You know, the, the 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 number of small independent retailers is falling and falling and falling as the ones, the 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 the, the, the few at the top get bigger and bigger and bigger and elbow everybody out. The danger of, is the same happening with energy. A, a few companies just own the whole thing. And in terms of democracy, communities owning their own energy generation and and then benefiting from from the return of that is hugely important. I think. Well, thank you for your answer. Uh, unfortunately, we are approaching the end of the session, so maybe we'll take one more question on the other side of the room. Yes? Okay. Hello, I'm Abiola Adebayo from Nigeria. Well, I was wondering, um, the transition movement, um, how can we um, establish it in a community where there is so much dependence on fossil fuel. For example, so many African countries, you know, um, telecommunication sector. There is um, you, you can you can't even make a phone call if you are not using for, um, fossil fuel. The 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 base stations are being powered by diesel and so many other things. How do you convince these people that um, the oil you are you are you are using would get to an end someday? Because they don't really care because it's, it's just their basic need and it needs to be met. Also, I was wondering also that uh, your statistics, um, the climate change statistics, is it well known to the Western world? Because this, this, the, the Western world still comes to um, oil-rich nations and they burn our gases. There, there's still gas flaring in Africa till 2011. So this... I want to ask you that um, is um, the CO2 generated in Africa going to affect Africa alone or is it going to affect the whole world at large? So I, I think um, it, there has to be massive movement in, uh, in uh, so many parts of the continent because I, from the map I saw in your um, transition movement, I think you have um, a point in the southern part of Africa, I'm not sure. So um, I don't know what other part of Africa you have um, strong influence on or other part of the world, because I think um, it has to be uh, a very strategic movement because um, you have to like prioritize um, your presence in, uh, across the globe. I don't know if you understand by my point. Thank you. Yeah, the, the acoustics aren't very good, so I think I, I heard about, I heard most of what, of what you said. So I, as I understand it, the... The question is: Is what does this? What might this look like in Africa, in a place where where people struggle to meet their basic needs, and the idea of of, of reducing 
fossil fuel dependency when people are struggling to meet their basic needs doesn't really no, feel no, very I, uh, I, very I, important I, to people. Was that sorry? basic? I, I meant that um, people use um, fossil fuel as in the, the, there's so much dependence on fossil fuel to make meet the basic needs, not that people strive to meet their basic needs. I don't know if you get what I said. Okay. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, transition was designed. I don't know if you know, if you've heard of of a model of climate, a climate thing called uh, uh, contraction and convergence, which is the idea that at the moment the West is consuming the, the wealthy West is consuming up here, and then the de developing nations are consuming down here. And what we need to do is to get to this point where 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 the world can sustain our emissions. So transition was really designed originally. As, as a kind of a detox for the West, in a sense. You know, how do we get the West down that way? Because at the moment, because it's harder to, to, to do that coming down because it feels like you're letting go of lots of stuff and you're moving away from something. So I guess the challenge of, of transition was, how do we make that coming down process feel like moving towards something uh, that's positive and feel like that's a future that we want to create? And that's really where transition came from, and and so it was designed really for, I suppose, Europe and for, for North America, uh, and we had no sense that it would have any relevance or interest anywhere other than that. So, um, but what's been really interesting uh, in the last six years, where transition has gone from just being here in 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 Totnes in Devon to being in thousands of places in 34 countries around the world. Because it was designed as a like open source software, as a self-organizing thing that people take it and try it out wherever they are, and so we're seeing transition all over Brazil, uh, with people in Brazil creating a Brazilian version of transition, which isn't motivated by peak oil, because as far as Brazil is concerned, peak oil is no problem. You know, we are the new Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, but they're doing incredible transition work in the favelas in São Paulo, very very poor parts of São Paulo. Um, motivated by social justice, motivated by uh, improving the place people live, creating new livelihoods for people, uh, making the place more beautiful. Uh, you know, we're starting to see transitions starting to emerge in, in places in, in, in Africa. But, the, but for me, the question is really, it's not for me to sit here and say, this is what transition should look like in Africa. That's for people in Africa to, 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 to do. And that's really how transition works. You know, when people are struggling to meet their basic needs, of course, you can't say to somebody, uh-uh, you know, uh, think of the climate. You know, it doesn't really work like that, as you say. And um, But I think there is an enormous amount uh, that can be done in terms of, of, of replacing those with, with renewables, and there's some really good organizations that are supporting that. And I think as well, you know, the... the, the um, sometimes transition is criticized because it's about localizing food production here in the UK and people or wherever and people say yeah but if the UK uh, becomes more self-reliant for food then actually places in Africa that grow food to export there are going to suffer but actually uh, in many cases that, that when uh, when African countries become driven by exporting food to the West uh, then there's generally been something gone horribly wrong a few years before that. And there are big implications for the food security of the place, uh, for land ownership, for, uh, for small farmers. Um, and so my sense is that actually it's really about building resilience uh, in the wealthier West, which is about reducing our consumption, uh, uh, finding ways of kind of um, strengthening local economies, that kind of thing. But then it's also about building resilience in the developing world, which is about food security, which is about um, which is about renewable energy, uh, and which is about a different model of development than just increasing and increasing fossil fuel dependency. Because it's the it's the developing nations that are able to develop their economies in such a way as they don't depend on cheap fossil fuels that are going to be the ones that really thrive uh, into the future. Okay. But in terms of what an African transition looks like. As I say, that's that's not for me to say, really. All I right. hope that answers the question. Thank you very much, Rev Hopkins. I think we already crossed the line, so we're going to say goodbye to you. And thank you again. I think we can applaud him. Yeah.
Thank you, and we wish you all the best for transition.ness, and we hope to read a lot of positive things about it. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Have a good day. Thank you. All right, so it's the end of the morning. Yeah, Vlad, do you want to say something? But first of all, I think we can also thank Camille and Nicholas who presented this session. Thank you again. Okay, Vlad has just a small announcement and then we are going to eat. Yes, and my announcement is precisely related to that. Um, first, uh, the details. So, sorry to inform you pretty late about the mugs, uh, so that uh, some of you didn't have the, uh, the opportunity to have it with them, since you had left them probably at the hostel. And uh, so, please uh, bring them over for the next days, and uh, then you'll have a, a nice little cup uh, with, with a sheep inside, as you, can see, as you have seen, and uh, you can use it for uh, all the drinks uh, and enjoy it. Uh, as for these glasses, in fact, these are reusable glasses, so please don't throw them away. Uh, we can clean them and we can reuse them. Um, as for the rest, um, we are going to have a very nice dinner at the main cafeteria of the campus, uh, which is in the other building called the uh, Banana, because of the shape of the building, as you, can, as you may have seen. And uh, we're going to uh, head there uh, just now. Just a uh, thing, you have all uh, received in your badge, you have a voucher in it for, these, uh, uh, for the menu for uh, today's uh, lunch. And um, please uh, you ver uh, check if you have this uh, voucher, or the otherwise come back to me, uh, I have extra ones. Uh, and um, just check at the cafeteria. Uh, I'll be putting up that sign uh, just beneath the, uh, the place, uh, just at the place where you'll be having the menu, because there, is, there are a number of menus, but we've arranged a negotiated menu, like vegetarian menu with local products, and uh, so you'll have, a, uh, you'll check for this sign and you'll see where you get, and then you get to the till and give the, give the voucher, and then enjoy the food. And uh, we'll uh, be back here at uh, half past one, so uh, enjoy and have a nice meal here. <laughs>